Welcome back. You're listening to the Transforming Federal HR Processes, sponsored by Cornerstone On Demand on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guest today, Veronica Hinton, the Principal Director for Civilian Personnel Policy at the Department of Defense. Veronica, before break, we went through your top three priorities, management improvements, HR reforms, IT tools. You laid them out. We went through a lot of the management improvements. Let's talk, jump into the HR reform side of this. And, and I want to go back to one of the things you said earlier about uh, a working group, an enterprise-wide improvement working group. Give me a little bit of basics about that. Are they meeting weekly, monthly? And, and what are some of their outcomes, outputs that you expect? Absolutely. Um, this group has been uh, chartered for, gosh, I think it's going on about 18 months or so. So we've been, we've been at this for a while. Um, and it really is an extension of work we've we've done back to 2010, as you referenced earlier, in terms of looking at uh, hiring improvement, took a little bit of a break and then said, we need to revitalize this. And so they meet, um, well, it's a community. So they meet regularly, just informally, but, but formally they meet, uh, I believe, monthly. And we've asked them in terms of outcomes is to really look at um, defining the process steps in the hiring process and come up with a DOD enterprise process model that all of our components um, can use uh, uh, segments in the hiring um, that we can then take from that and build out training, build out education um, in each of those segments, and then build out processes that we can agree to. And, and it's really related to also some work that we're doing in uh, modernizing our information technology. One of the outcomes is how do we need everyone on a standard enterprise approach, not only to understand uh, the impediments to timely hiring, timely hiring, but also because we want to use uniform IT tools. And so in order to do that, we need folks to be on, on the same uh, process model. And so that is also one of their outcomes. And then start to set uh, metrics so that we can understand um, where to focus our energy and our attention um, as we encounter these pain points. It's interesting uh, that you go back to the, the coming up with a process model. I, in some ways, is the goal if the Army and the Navy, the Air Force and Marines, when it comes to civilian employees now, mm -hmm. if they're all hiring at least very similar or the same, you know, maybe the 80-20 rule or 90-10 rule, does that also give the opportunity to share the certifications more easily? Hey, if I know you went through these five steps, I can then take, hey, you didn't hire this person, but maybe I can hire them, or maybe I have an opening that fits better. Yeah, I think that's a long-term strategic outcome, <laughs> Jason. I think every agency struggles with that. You're, you're hearkening back to the Competitive Service Act, I yeah. believe, and the ability to share certificates. Um, I think that's everyone's aspirational goal. We're not there yet, um, but where we are is really having the conversations to share best practices of how we recruit. So where do we go get that talent um, if, if one component, if the Marines learned, uh, you talked about cyber accepted service earlier and their uh, pivot to cyber uh, accepted service and, and deploying that in uh, Mars Cyber. So if they come up with some kind of best in breed recruitment strategies, we want this hiring improvement work group to be able to take that and export it across the department. So those are the types of outcomes we would expect. And just briefly, uh, do you expect kind of reports from them every six months, every year? Because obviously work groups can get together and work and work and work, but right. when can we do something from what, all that work? Absolutely, and, and actually it's it's sort of a nice pivot to talk a little bit about our human capital operating plan, um, which is our link directly into the National Defense Strategic Plan, which tells us in the human capital community, um, come up with new and inventive ways of doing hiring, of finding talent. And so we have a couple of reporting requirements um, that we, we report to the chief management officer on what we're doing to improve hiring, come up with innovative solutions. And then we, uh, within the civilian personnel community, within the department, we meet monthly. Um, and as part of our human capital operating plan, we have initiatives and one of them is improving hiring. And so um, every quarter through our HR stat review, uh, which is our performance management review, we talk about um, where are we with these different initiatives? Are we achieving the outcomes that we want? Um, where do we need to tweak priorities, focus, resources? Um, and then every month we pick one or two particular areas to focus in on. And so um, the hiring improvement group, um, unfortunately or fortunately, I think they get monthly love <laughs> <laughs> because this is of such importance to the department. I mean, it's embedded in our, our agency strategic plan and we track it because it's, it's something that fundamentally we have to fix in the department. 
I haven't heard the term HR stat in a couple of years. <laughs> it's good to see that they're still it's uh, happening. Still out there. I always thought those were, uh, uh, we got statted out by the last administration right. with portfolio stat, stat and tech stat <laughs> and cyber stat, but it's good to see HR stats still going. Okay. You mentioned also one of the things that this group is doing is looking at, at, at making, simplifying, making uh, it easier for the hiring managers, the HR staff to use all these hiring authorities. There's 23 of them, you said, in the last maybe decade or so. Right. What are some, and then let's, how is this group or how is the Chico community kind of making uh, this, these authorities easier to understand and yeah, use? Yeah, it's, it's um, so we in DOD have received 23 hiring uh, flexibilities, different types of flexibilities from Congress, and it could be from something as broad as you have a direct hiring authority to be able to go out and hire any positions located at a depot or a shipyard or something as targeted as positions that are associated with business transformation um, or financial management as another one you mentioned earlier. And so what happens is as we receive these authorities, which are all slightly nuanced, individual, unique, you know, it may be quota driven, they may have different expiration, they may have different grade levels of eligibility. Um, we have to one, drop what we're doing and implement policy. So we have to take the law, turn it into a, a policy and implementation. We need to train on it so our HR professionals know how to use them. And we have to build out the processes and systems to support them. And so um, it, it really focuses us on more policy development as opposed to strategic outcomes. Um, but the good news is what we found is these, these direct hire authorities are very effective. They have allowed us to really go after that uh, unique or specific talent uh, and bring them into the department um, more rapidly. So I, I'll give you an example. Um, at our uh, depots, our Air Force depots, they have, using their one of their unique authorities, have been able to uh, reduce time to hire for certain positions to 40 days. Can you imagine that, right? We talked about 100 days earlier, so there, we're having success there. Our shipyards have seen a 28% reduction. And more broadly across the department, um, where we've used direct hire authorities, we've seen a 20% reduction compared to our traditional hiring methods. So, so they're very effective. Um, it's just very inefficient because we have so many of them. And so what we're, we've been looking at um, is where are there opportunities uh, statutorily uh, with Congress to be able to start to streamline some of those. And then really, uh, we always wanna control our, our own destiny is within those things that we can control administratively, where are there opportunities for us to streamline like authorities? Um, where is there opportunity to highlight those that are most effective? Uh, the acquisition community recently published the Section 809 report. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but one of the key takeaways was there are all these hiring authorities but you really only use four or five of them most effectively. HR community, why don't you advertise those to the hiring managers and hiring managers focus on those. Um, and so that's really a, just a parallel effort, right? And an affirmation that, that um, kind of the complex cumbersome system that we have now, while it allows us to achieve some of the outcomes we want, is probably not the most efficient way of, of manner of doing it. When you talk about these 23 hiring authorities, is that over and above things like Schedule A and Schedule C and some of the things that OPM is giving government-wide like for cybersecurity or IT modernization? Absolutely, we have some defense unique authorities in addition to the OPM-wide and then the tr traditional Title V. Does, does that worry you at all that everything is now a unique hiring authority and, and, and you know what, what's left? Or it, like you understand why Congress is giving you these authorities. Like the, the statistics are great. I mean, the idea, of reducing, you know, 40 days to get someone in is, is, is probably as good as the private sector. The the reduction at shipyards at 28% or the cross the department 20% is tremendous. It's important. But what's left that's not if you don't have a higher authority for, for the chief human capital <laughs> right. officer position, is that like, oh we don't we're not loved? Right, absolutely. Well, not that we're not loved, no. but it, it absolutely is uh, something we ponder about because um, we have so many exceptions, right? We talked about that earlier. Uh, it's really not the monolith system anymore. And so we have, what, 60 plus personnel systems in, in our department alone. And 60 is too many. One's not the right answer. 60 is not the right answer. There's an answer somewhere in between that. You know, a handful of the most effective best practices, uh, best systems probably meets the need, the majority of the needs of our department. And so um, from a strategic out, outlook of where we're trying to go, that's what we want to get to. Is there, a, is there an effort right now that, or is this uh, enterprise-wide improvement work group looking at 
how to take those 60 plus and reduce it to, to whatever the right number is, five, 10, whatever it is, or is that done? Is that being done through a higher level of the chief management officer? So it, it's it's both. So we've got um, so we have a hiring improvement enterprise work group, um, and then part of our broader HR reform effort, which is nestled under the chief management officer. Um, where those three line of efforts we talked about came from, um, we work very closely with them in pursuing you know, where do we need legislative solutions, where do we need administrative solutions, um, where do we need technology solutions, and so um, it really is all critical stakeholders rowing in the same direction. The, the other piece of this is, we talked about time to hire, and your statistics show that there's improvements. Generally speaking, are there other actions you guys are taking beyond the direct hire authority that you're addressing time to hire? Uh, you mentioned training several times. That's part of the process. Hey, hey hiring a manager, you can't sit on those you know, resumes for, for six weeks and then complain it took too long to hire. Right, absolutely. So we have um, a couple of things that we're doing with regard to that. So we recently launched a um, human resources life cycle course uh, that we're bringing uh, across the department to bring our, our HR professionals in um, to understand how to use the authorities, um, how to use the tools available to them, and just really keep refreshing. So um, OPM is doing something similar with the Federal Human Resources Institute and, and rolling out staffing classes, which is great. Uh, we're a partner with them and we support them, um, but the reality is they, they can teach the fundamentals, but our department, because we have so many unique authorities, we need to be able to train our own HR professionals. So we have work in that area. Um, and some of the standard tools that you would expect, things like job aids, um, things that would help the hiring manager um, be able to more quickly respond to their hiring needs. And I think that's part of the, the challenge here is there's so much work that has to get done, not just to hire someone, but just every day that hiring sometimes can take a back. So you gotta remind people you have certain tools, you have certain authorities, and you have certain ways right. to, to speed it up. Let's, we've talked a lot about hiring, let's go to the opposite side. Uh, you mentioned the ability to, to deal with poor performers. That's always been, if you will, a bugaboo in government. Well, you can't get rid of people or it's too hard to get rid of people, so you either promote them or transfer them or detail them away, and that doesn't solve necessarily the problem. You mentioned that, that you guys are also looking at that issue. Absolutely, so uh, we, we say we, we, hire, we do more than hire, firing, and wiring in the HR community, um, but the performance piece is a critical part, right? So we get the talent, we get them in the board, uh, we think through retention, but then we also have to make sure that we have an engaged workforce. And when we have performance challenges, um, how do we address them? And so one of the goals um, of the administration broadly when they came in was um, asking agencies to, to think about how you maximize employee performance. Um, and then the president's management agenda has that as one of the key sub-elements, and, and DOD is a co-lead of the, the CAP goal, the cross-agency goal, on uh, priority on workforce management and performance. And so we uh, sourced with RAND to, to sponsor a study that looks at what are the, the things we need to think about, what are the inhibitors that keep us from being able to address poor performance. Um, and, and it's interesting, it, it's, the things that came out of it weren't necessarily things that intuitively we don't know, right? We need to make sure that um, our, our uh, managers have the tools that they need um, and the training to understand uh, what uh, avenues are available to them to address poor performance. Um, we also need to make sure HR professionals are there to support them um, in a timely manner so they get the timely, su timely support. Um, and, and the other outcome from the study uh, was we need to create a, a profession of supervisors. Um, we, we tend to, to promote uh, into our supervisory managerial ranks based on technical ability, yep. um, and then we need to help them make that pivot uh, to supervision as a profession, as a culture of accountability. And so uh, based on that, we've actually worked a couple of recommendations um, to get at that specifically. Um, one is we're piloting management support boards. So it's this real-time expertise um, that helps managers, if they have uh, issues, they can come to a seasoned, experienced supervisor and really have some mentoring or some coaching. Uh, we're, we're piloting that in my own organization, uh, more small, uh, uh, on a small scale, uh, where we've set up uh, recurring meetings, we've set up office hours where any supervisor can come in and um, talk to 
a, a handful of supervisors that have agreed to be mentors and just work through issues and help them understand tools. Um, we had some success with that, and so now we're working with the with Army actually to pilot this on a, a more grand scale. Fifteen hundred supervisors down at Army Material Command in Fort Rucker, Alabama, and really start to instill a culture and community of uh, a practice among supervisors. Uh, and hopefully in FY20, we'll start to see the results and see where we can expand that. But based on our preliminary, what we're seeing within our own organization, um, it's really been a helpful model for our supervisors. I, I think that's a great example of this. So often you hear about senior executive service in the civilian world. Uh, I know you guys have an equivalent or you have SES, and they always talk about, well, you gotta have a mentor, and then part of their job is to mentor, but there's so little time. and, and Telling you know, kind of asking people and, and to carve out that time is so important. What's the reaction been? I can only imagine people are excited because we all want to share our, our how smart we are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, not only that, share how smart we are. <laughs> I mean, I like how you speak those in, Jason. I, I mean, in <laughs> it is way. a good way that I mean, we want to share. But it's also about um, compassion and um, camaraderie, and so making sure that you, you know, where you feel trepidation to take those actions that you have someone there supporting you to, to help build your fortitude. So um, co conflict management, one of the key core qualifications for leadership for, for especially at the executive levels is, is typically one of the competencies that we all struggle with. And so having someone there with you to be able to, to help guide you through, whether it's a peer supervisor, whether it's a mentor or a coach, really will, pays dividends and we're seeing that. Excellent. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we jump, come back, we're going to talk technology. There's a ton to talk there. There's a lot of opportunities. Absolutely. You're listening to the panel discussion, Transforming Federal HR Processes, sponsored by Cornerstone On Demand on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network.